Moses for, um, for inviting me to come speak here today. Uh, yeah, so I am currently a, uh, uh, a postdoctoral fellow at the Kabul Institute uh, at Cornell. Uh, but I'm, today I'm going to be discussing some work uh, that I did as a PhD student uh, at, at Caltech. Okay, so throughout this conference, uh, one of the main themes has been uh, what are some novel methods for uh, light matter control of material, using light matter interactions to control uh, emergent material properties. And there have been three main methods uh, that have been discussed. So the first is uh, flow plane engineering, or using the time periodic uh, aspect of light uh, to modify material properties. Uh, to use uh, nonlinear phononics and mode selective uh, routes uh, to engineer material properties, uh, and then uh, to use uh, cavities to direct to, to control fluctuations of material by using uh, the vacuum fluctuations of um, the, that, that occur in cavity. Uh, however, in each of these cases, uh, what we don't consider are like direct excitations across the band gap in the material, and in fact. Uh, usually we want to limit these effects in these cases. So for example, one challenge in flow plane engineering is that many of the results have been performed in uh, metallic systems, so you can, there's a limit to how hard you can drive before you destroy uh, the material. Um, so uh, the reason I mention this is I'm going to actually do the opposite. I'm going to intentionally uh, introduce charges into the material through photodoping. So I'm going to you know, take a, maybe a step back a few decades in, in ultrafast science and then apply this technique uh, to, to uh, mod insulators. So what is photodoping for, you know, anybody who doesn't know it? When you take a pulse of light and you drive the material resonant with the band gap. So you're creating uh, a real hole-like excitation and a real electron-like uh, excitation simultaneously. And why would we want to do this? So that, and why, you know, as I said before, why are we focusing on anti-ferromagnets. And as we know, uh, this is a very, you know, uh, often shown picture. When you dope these systems, uh, you melt the uh, anti-ferromagnetic uh, insulating order of the uh, parent compound. Uh, and many interesting phases emerge, such as superconductivity, uh, charge density waves, uh, strange metal pseudo gaps, and, and so on and so forth. So the question is, uh, is the photodoped phase diagram equally rich? If we, instead of using chemical doping, uh, to, to uh, change the, dope, uh, the doping concentration. If we use light, is the non-equilibrium phase diagram, is it equally rich uh, to this equilibrium phase diagram? Uh, and actually, in recent years, this has become, this has gained uh, a lot of interest uh, in the field, uh, and uh, especially in the theoretical realm. So here I show uh, kind of a snapshot of all the theoretical papers that have come out, you know, just in the past 10 years or so. Uh, and there's been an uptick in, in the previous few years. And uh, you know, just I, I made that slide because I wanted to make this slide, and I didn't know how to put all the citations here. Uh, but uh, you know, many phenomena have been predicted. So the Mont gap collapse, uh, superconductivity, and interesting types of out uh, superconductivity that are actually limited to the photodoped range uh, regime. Um, charge density waves, exciton formation, non-thermal magnetic phases, hidden spin orbital phases, metastable trapping. Uh, but what's interesting is that most of these uh, have not, so you may ask what is the phase diagram that you can compile from all of these results, uh, but unfortunately experimentally we don't know, uh, and most of these phases uh, haven't been observed. Uh, what we have observed so far is uh, the onset of metallicity, uh, you know, and there's debates as to whether that's simply because you've created free charges or whether you're actually collapsing the band gap, that's kind of what Dong Song's uh, Talk, talked about, uh, uh, that's what Dong Song spoke about uh, yesterday, um, or a few days ago. Uh, and the other thing we've observed is uh, non-thermal melting of the anti-ferromagnetic order. So when you, when you dope these, when you photodope these systems, the anti-ferromagnetic order disappears beyond a certain threshold of doping, similar to equilibrium. But none of the emergence, uh, we haven't seen the emergence of any of the other of these phases. So we've collapsed kind of the anti-ferromagnetic insulating phase, but we haven't seen any other interesting phases come out. And I think, you know, experimentally, the reason we haven't seen this is because although photodoping seems trivial, it's something that, you know, we always try to avoid when we're in these ultra-fast labs, but uh, I, I think there are actually a lot of open questions about photodoping, especially in a strongly correlated system like a mod insulator. And I think the reason we don't 
know what's in this phase diagram is because we still have a lot of open questions about what actually a photodopant is in these materials. How does it behave? What does it do? And how does it read from us? Um, okay, so what are these open questions? So initially, uh, there's the question of photo excitation. So how are these photodopants actually generated? Meaning, you know, one example is what I just spoke about. Does the mod gap collapse? Or are we just, you know, moving the charges around? Uh, and then uh, there's questions about what are their dynamics? How do they move? This, you know, begs the question of, of things like spin polarons. Do they behave? Uh, how does the, you know, uh, how are these carriers renormalized as they move through the antiferromagnetic lattice? And then are there interactions between holons and doublons? Uh, and do these interactions cause any instabilities? And then finally, how do they recombine, right? This question of recombination has been studied uh, very extensively in semiconducting systems, but it, uh, I think it needs more investigation in, in uh, um, the case of Mott insulators. So for this talk, uh, you know, any photodoping experiment is naturally gonna touch on all of these things because you're photodoping the system. Uh, but in this talk, I'm gonna specifically focus on uh, this interaction. Can we consider interactions between holons and doublons? Uh, and how do we consider the recombination of these holons and doublons? And uh, uh, the most simple question we can ask, something that's readily studied in semiconductors, uh, is do excitons form in these photodoped monosolators, right? Uh, um, you know, uh, in, an ex in a semiconductor, we know that when we drive the material, uh, initially you're going to create a hot uh, electron hole plasma, so the system will become metallic. And then as these carriers cool towards the band edge, uh, their recombination will be bottlenecked by the fact that there's a gap. So in the interim, in the interim period to lower their energy, uh, they'll emit a smaller amount of energy and then form an exciton. So this exciton is like a, kind of this intermediate favorable state between photo excitation and, and recombination. So uh, it may seem then trivial, like why wouldn't, um, if this happens so often in a, in a semiconductor, why doesn't it happen in a mod insulator? And uh, to uh, answer this question, we need to consider the differences between a photo, the dynamics of a photodopant in a mod insulator and the dynamics of a photodopant uh, in a semiconductor. So in a mod insulator, uh, especially here, I need to be more specific, I'm specifically discussing two-dimensional uh, spin one-half mod insulators. Right? They have some unique properties, so basically the, the limit that the, the Cooper is right. Uh, Okay, so in this case, when I create an excitation from the lower Hubbard band to the upper Hubbard band, what I'm doing in this case, uh, oh, sorry, uh, let's consider a chemical doping first. So here I'm just whole doping the system, right? I'm just uh, removing uh, an electron from the lower Hubbard band. Spatially, what this does is it creates a hole in the antiferromagnetic lattice, right? And as this hole hops around, each time it hops, it's going to create uh, a set of spin flips, right? So each time it hops, it creates a spin flip. Uh, you know, there's another one here, and then another one here. So basically, uh, the motion of the hole, or the motion of the dopant, leaves in its wake uh, a string of magnetic excitations, right? So you need to consider uh, the fact that, uh, you know, the, the charge degrees of freedom are inherently coupled to the spin degrees of freedom in the system. So this is what happens in a chemically doped system. Let's consider what happens in a <coughs> photodope system. So in a photodope system, what you're doing is you're creating an excitation from the lower Hubbard band to the upper Hubbard band, so you're simultaneously creating uh, an empty site, which is shown in white here, and a doubly occupied site, which I'm showing uh, in purple here, right? So now let's again consider the motion of these two carriers. So if the empty site pops one site, uh, it's going to create again this string of uh, this excitation. But uh, now there's this like linear potential, right? That each time this uh, empty site hops, it's going to create uh, more and more excitations. So what can happen is that the doubly occupied site can follow in its path, right? And when it does that, it returns this spin up electron, uh, the spin down electron that the uh, empty site displaced. The doubly occupied site will then put it back into an energetically favorable spot. So basically, the uh, one, the the motion of one carrier repairs the destruction to the spin sector that is created by the other carrier. And in this Sorry, way, but is it obvious that the double line? repairs the exchange effect? I think if you just assume that it's like another defect, uh, like in the same oh, way as the whole one. It's a problem. Yeah. Why does it not have an exchange cost in the next to um, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't understand. I just need you uh, to explain it to me. Well, I think people have people hold rules and create this chain. The double follows the fall, right? It actually restores the screens back to the screen is electrons move to the wrong sub and the double moves it to 
new elections back because of both of them. But I go there. I think there I is. I thought that the, the line there was an exchange cost. What, what was an exchange cost? Exactly, then? but what this means is that the electron is on the wrong sub lattice, like the electron from A sub lattice. Well, the spin is in the wrong, in the wrong sub lattice. So, yeah. But now my question is when you have a double line, is that expensive or is it, does it, is it? So if they move together, then the double can remove damage done by the cold. I think what Andrea is asking is like uh, in a Dublin, there's like still a spin up and a spin down. So it's always going to be energetically on the Dublin spin up and spin down. And then north you have a spin down and south you have a I think Andrea, down. like the, the difference is that uh, mm -hmm. it's always going to have, imagine you just had a Dublin. Uh, no matter where you put it in the lattice or no matter where you move it, the string is, if you move it, the string will keep growing. But that, that cost that you're talking about is always going to be there. It's just a, a cost of the of having the double. You know, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't grow. That does it doesn't grow. Whether and actually, if anything, being closer to the yes. whole line is better because you lose one of those bonds. You know, so it's always that's another reason why it would want to be be closer. Yeah. Okay. So actually, this coherent motion uh, is what is called uh, a Hubbard exciton. So it's an exciton, so an electron hole bound state that forms not from the Coulomb interaction, but obviously there's going to be maybe some <laughs> Coulomb contribution, but let's ignore that for now. Uh, it's the forming not by the Coulomb interaction, but by this uh, you know, uh, interplay between the spin and charge degrees of freedom. So it's trying to minimize the damage to the, to the spin degrees of freedom. OK, um, so why, why, like, why is this still something that is not, like, uh, why, why are there still open questions about this? You know, why haven't we studied them? And there are many reasons, uh, and you know, there, one of the reasons is that the stability of these pairs is actually still an open question, uh, experimentally. Okay, but what do I mean by this? So here is a paradigmatic, like, modest later neutron titanate, and uh, you know, unlike a semiconductor where you see sharp peaks below the band edge, here what has been assigned to an excitonic origin actually is that broad mode there, right? So you can tell it's very different than what you expect in semiconducting spectra. And the most important kind of portion of, the, of this figure is that uh, it overlaps with the continuum, right? So what this implies is that the exciton is actually ephemeral, right? It's, it's on top of the continuum, so it's always <coughs> going to be unstable against the K into the free, yeah, hold on, double. Uh, is a ferromagnet. Uh, this is, uh, I, I think I just picked this picture because it's, it's broad, but actually. Uh, That's a ferromagnet. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I, I can also show this for uh, the cuprates, uh, for example. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, there's a, a group in Japan that uh, identified one of the uh, kind of labels in the optical spectrum of uh, LCO and NCO to uh, an exciton similar to this. And they make the same argument, that that label is on top of the continuum. So it, again, implies that uh, the exciton is unstable. In, in that material. So I, I just picked this, I should probably replace it with that. Uh, oh, I'm to yeah, or, or just any other material. You're right, you're right. Anything but not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my apologies, thanks for catching that. But, but the argument still remains that in most of the materials where you do see these, these bumps that are assigned to an exotonic origin, they're on top of the continuum, unlike uh, uh, in the semiconductors where they're clearly below. So again, this implies uh, that the uh, uh, hold on, double on. Uh, this implies that the excitonic states are ephemeral, uh, and you know, uh, in the photo excited state of the material, uh, you may ask, is it stable for excitons to form in that interface? Do they actually contribute to the dynamics, or can we just completely ignore them? So the experimental challenge here, again, I'm going to use neutron titanium, just to ignore that for now. But the experimental challenge, it was just, it was just the nicest figure I found, but <laughs> the experimental challenge is that uh, you want to study, then to answer this question, you want to independently study free carrier dynamics and bound carrier dynamics, right? But if they spectrally overlap, you know, if I'm going to do a pump probe measurement and probe reflectivity at 2 eV, there's no way of distinguishing whether what I'm seeing is from the free carriers or for the bound carriers. So uh, what I'm going to show in the rest of the talk is that there's actually a way to distinguish between their dynamics in the terahertz regime, where there's no you know, spectral weight uh, so we can clearly identify the differences between the two. So to understand how we're going to probe this in the spec in the terahertz regime, uh, let's look at the structure of an excitonic, you know, uh, system. So here I'm showing uh, 
kind of a very generic uh, schematic of what excitons look like in an optical spectrum of a material. So here you have the three particle band gap. So this marks transitions from the, the valence band to the convection band. And below that, you'll see a series of sharp peaks. Each one of those uh, represents uh, an excitonic state. So the n equals one is the excitonic ground state. And then these are you know, excited states of, of, of the exciton. Um, and what we define as the optical band gap, I guess, is, is the difference between uh, the vacuum to, to creating the first exciton. OK. So uh, what I, the, remember I said that we're going to look at the terahertz regime. Right? So these transitions from, from the vacuum to uh, the excitonic state are you know, in the visible or infrared regime, depending on the material. So how do we get to the terahertz regime? So in, what we do is we probe transitions between excitonic states. So how do we do this? So if we're doing an equilibrium spectroscopy, there's no excitons are an inherently out of equilibrium quantum like uh, particle, right? So when we do an equilibrium probe, uh, all what we can do is probe this transition, right? Because you can't probe from a from one transition to another that, that doesn't exist. Like we can't probe that n equals one to n equals two transition because you don't have any excitons in the system. But instead, if you consider this first pulse now to be a pump pulse, where I've created a population of excitons, then all of these transitions become available. And then I can come in with a terahertz pulse uh, and probe these intra-excitonic transitions. So that, that's, the tech, that's the experiment that uh, we're going to try to do here in, in a modest layer. OK, and why, why do I want to do this? Why am I going through all this trouble to study an intra-excitonic transition in the terahertz region? And as I said before, it's so that we can distinguish between free and bound carriers. So free whole and double pairs are just free carriers. Uh, as they traverse, if we create them and then probe the terahertz response, what we'll see is a Druida response because uh, the system is metallic because of the introduction of these free carriers. But bound carriers, because instead we're probing the intra-excitonic transitions, what we'll see is a Lorentzian response. Uh, so basically, by measuring the photo the photo induced spectrum and then uh, fitting you know with the Druida Lorentz model and then looking at the relative spectral weight of the Druida components and the Lorentzian components, you now have a very clear uh, way to distinguish between the amount of free carriers and the amount of bound carriers in your material. So uh, the other kind of thing I want to point out is that in this case, we're studying an excitonic ensemble right? that you've prepared with your pump pulse. So you know, there's excitonic exciton interactions and, and uh, so on and so forth. So uh, you know, the, in, in semiconductors, uh, it's been known that you can have a sort of phase diagram of, of these exciton ensembles. Uh, and the simplest kind of phase in this is an excitonic fluid. So where you just have a bunch of excitons, and they either weakly interact or they don't interact at all. So that's kind of the phase we're going to target, because uh, basically you just have a bunch of excitons that don't do anything. They're just there. Um, OK, so how do you prepare this excitonic fluid? So one way uh, is to pump the system uh, uh, above the mod gap. So you're creating free holons and doublons. And then as they cool and go towards the bound edge, that at the band edge, then it may be favorable for them to form excitons, right? So in this case, all the free uh, carriers uh, will stay there, and then they'll form excitons. So you should see a transition from a predominantly free carrier response to a predominantly bound carrier response uh, as time goes on. OK, so what material are we going to do this in? Uh, we chose strontium iridate uh, 214. Uh, because of two reasons. First, it's a single, like a true, if we believe this uh, spin one half picture, uh, it's a true uh, single band mod insulator, right? There's a lower hover band and an upper hover band, and there's no bands in between, right? So we, we don't have to complicate with additional bands or having to make approximations to the single band model. We can just say it's, it's in the single band model. And then the second reason uh, is that it has strong exchange interactions. So uh, it's not quite as strong as the cuprates, but uh, it's, uh, the exchange interaction in this material is known to be uh, uh, 60 MeV. So it should be very uh, hospitable to these uh, type of uh, magnetic string climbing uh, mechanisms that I spoke about a few slides ago. So the experiment we did uh, is a uh, infrared pump, near infrared pump, terahertz probe. So we pumped uh, at 0.6 oh, EV. Uh, you answer my question. Uh, the like in uh, in in uh, let me. It's uh, we pump 0.6 eV. So uh, I'm kind of skipping to the middle of my talk. But uh, yeah, this is uh, the the optical spectrum. So we're pumping resonate with this alpha beam. So around it's the, the optical back uh, depends how you define the gap. 
Here I'm defining it as where the, the alpha peak here is the lower to upper hover band transition, so I'm just defining it as like the alpha peak position. Yeah? The question was about the choice of your material that this uh, excitation, it takes the uh, charge from one side and put it into another side, or can forget about the band, etc. Yeah. That there is no orbital content on each side, but two breaks. Yeah. That, that's so kind of what I'm considering. That I'm just so doing an iridium to iridium charge so transfer. Dipole is dominated by just the of this. Yeah. The yeah, that, that's why we chose this material. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so yeah, uh, then we uh, so we pump with this uh, pump pulse that's resonant with the lower and upper Hubbard band transition. Uh, and then we come in with a broadband terahertz pulse. So it's uh, like half a terahertz to six terahertz or an MEV 0.5 to 25 terahertz. Uh, and then uh, we measure the photo-induced spectrum using an electro-optic sampling technique. Uh, so this is T, uh, there's two, two times in this, material, in this detection, right? There's the time, the electro-optic sampling time where we probe the sampling pulse, and then there's the pump probe time delay T uh, that comes between the infrared pulse and, and the terahertz pulse. So I just wanted to distinguish that from here. But whenever, from now on, whenever I say time delay, I'm talking about this time delay. Because what we do, uh, is we Fourier transform this pulse and then we look at the differential changes to the terahertz spectrum. So uh, we kind of lose this time information, uh, time because we, we don't lose it, but we convert to frequency, so we don't care about it. Yeah? Uh, I'm kind of confused. I mean, you're, you're saying that you have resolution from the pump to a, the probe, so and then the probe within the waveform So you can ignore kind of the length of, of the probe, or like TOS. Like it doesn't matter what like we have a way of making sure that the time resolution is just set by uh, the width of the pump pulse and the sampling <coughs> pulse we can ignore kind of the fact that the terahertz pulse is very long in time so uh, just just ignore the fact that we sample in this way and, and just look at the, the spectrum because the, the time resolution doesn't like uh, it's not determined by the width of, of the terahertz the pulse. sampling pulse is a spectron yeah exactly it's just it's <laughs> using that to measure a spec to measure and then it takes yeah, just just imagine we're going into to a spectrometer basically, and then and then it's the same. Uh, okay. Yeah, and we can discuss the details later, but but for the sake of, of time, it, it it doesn't matter how long your terahertz pulse is. Really. Okay, so here's what a, as I had promised, we're going to Fourier transform that time domain pulse, and then we get a, a spectrum. So on the x-axis is uh, the frequency. Uh, of the terahertz pulse, and on the y-axis is the pump probe time delay, so the, 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 the distance between the sampling pulse and, and the terahertz pulse, right? So what we see, uh, basically if I take a horizontal cut, that's basically like looking at the pump probe time the, 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 the spectrum at a particular pump probe time delay. So what we see, if we take this cut and plot it up there, what we see are uh, three sharp modes, and then this very broad mode. Okay, uh, it, it looks very broad, but it, it is a mode, as I'll show you with the uh, uh, optical conductivity data later. Um, and these three broad modes here, uh, the, uh, sorry, the three sharp modes uh, are uh, phonons. They're the lowest energy phonons in, the, in this system. So basically here we're just seeing pump-induced, like, you know, renormalization of the phonon uh, absorption. So it's nothing interesting. But this broad mode here has actually never been measured, uh, either in equilibrium or in... Uh, time resolved techniques. And just to be sure that we don't see it in our material, that it's not a defect or something in our material, we measured the equilibrium spectrum uh, using a terahertz transmission spectroscopy. And we see that here the index of refraction is completely flat in this region. So this uh, peak that appears only appears after the system has been uh, photo excited. Uh, and I want to emphasize that uh, this peak lies above uh, the highest energy zone sensor magnetic excitations, but below the, high, the lowest energy uh, structural excitations. Yeah. The reason we don't see anything below T equals zero is that you have to normalize against your response. Right? Yeah. T, and so, uh, yeah, exactly. So what I meant, what I'm plotting here is delta E over E. So it's the change of the electric field normalized by the equilibrium of the electric field. Yeah. Okay. So uh, because I'm measuring uh, the pulse and time domain, and then Fourier transforming it. Actually, what I'm doing, uh, well, actually, I gain uh, access to both the real and imaginary parts. Uh, uh, of, it's like a complex measure. So I can convert this uh, delta E over E spectrum uh, into the real and imaginary parts of the optical conductivity. So what I'm going to show on the next slide 
uh, is that the real and imaginary parts of the optical conductivity, uh, or the transient changes to optical conductivity, in this energy window for a series of uh, cuts, horizontal cuts. And then we can see how the, mold, mo how the mode forms as a function of time. OK, so again, as, as Jerome just noted, before time 0, we see nothing because uh, the pump hasn't arrived, so it's flat as expected. Immediately after the arrival of the pump pulse, we see a positive signal uh, in the real and imaginary uh, parts. Okay, so that's uh, at what you'd expect for a system that has become metallic after you pump it. And then, uh, as time goes on, what we see is that in the real part, spectral weight begins to accumulate at a particular frequency, forming a peak. And in the imaginary part, you get this clear dispersive line shape with a zero crossing. So clearly by 1.65 picoseconds, uh, the spectrum is completely dominated by uh, this Lorentzian response. So what we did was we fit this with a, a sum of a Druda and a Lorentz, a Druda, like a Druda component and a Lorentz oscillator, uh, and then we integrated over the over each bit to get the spectral weight of the Druda component and the spectral weight of the Lorentzian component, and that's what I'm plotting here. So uh, in the dark purple is the Druda component, and in the light purple is this Lorentzian component. And you see immediately after the rise of the pump. Your Druda component comes on, as, as we know will happen, because you've formed a bunch of hot carriers. And then this decays exponentially. And coinciding with the decay of the uh, Druda component is the rise of this Lorentzian component. So what you see here is a crossover from a Druda metallic-like -like response to a Lorentzian-dominated insulating response. And it's insulating, you know, or approaching insulating uh, as, as time goes on. Okay. So could you not have gotten this um Kinetics just by photoluminescence, like do this exponents photoluminescence? No. Uh, as I'll show later, the, there's no signatures of these in, in equilibrium spectroscopy, and I have some ideas of why you don't see them in equilibrium spectroscopy. Uh, but you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to see this in photoluminescence. And as I discussed a few slides ago, even if they did appear in photoluminescence, uh, you don't know if your signal at that frequency is increasing because of you're creating more free carriers or more excitonic carrier. You know, because they, they overlap in, in frequency. Uh, so yeah, what we posit actually is that this is a crossover from a uh, Druda-like response uh, dominated by the formation of free carriers and uh, a Lorentzian-like response uh, that uh, uh, marks the transition from one excitonic energy level to another. Um, okay, so the first question we asked ourselves is what, what then controls the time scale at which this excitonic response uh, recombines? Okay, so uh, to kind of get more information, we did a te we we measured this spectrum as a function of t temperature, and we looked at how the recombination dynamics change as a function of temperature. And there's a few important features we need to explain to understand the recombination pathway uh, of of these carriers. So first uh, is that there's a very fast decay. It's on the order of one picosecond. So whatever causes this decay should be maybe uh, it's indicative of of some sort of strong coupling between the bath that uh, between the exciton and the bath that you're decaying into. The second is that there is single exponential behavior. So uh, there's only one decay pathway here. Uh, so actually, sub picosecond decay, in, in most semiconductors, the decay is actually very slow. It's like tens of picoseconds, hundreds of picoseconds. But in, in, some, in, in, one, you know, in some materials, uh, you know, such as the TMDCs, uh, Rupert Huber saw that there's a very fast decay, like a uh, couple hundred femtoseconds. But it's only a small portion of the excitons that are in the light cone. So you see one fast decay for those excitons that are that can couple radiatively, and then you see again a very slow decay for all the other excitons that lie outside the light cone because there needs to be some higher order exciton exciton recombination to, to access those. But here we see one single exponential behavior, so uh, that implies that all the excitons couple to the same path to decay. And then finally, we see a very strong temperature dependence. So uh, you can tell, uh, sorry. Uh, there's a rendering issue, so all the temperatures disappeared uh, in, in this picture. Uh, but this uh, orange one is at 300 Kelvin, uh, and this blue one is at uh, uh, 80 Kelvin. So I'm, I'm cooling down as this goes on. And you can see just by eye that uh, this decay time is much faster at, 80, uh, at 300 Kelvin than it is at 80 Kelvin. Uh, and what we did was we fit this with a single exponential, and you can see uh, that the terahertz, uh, uh, the, the the decay constant uh, increases. And as a control, we also measured uh, pump probe reflectivity at 800, so above the, the Mach gap. Uh, and while there is some temperature dependence, it's not nearly as strong uh, uh, as, uh, yeah. 
But I would have expected naively that this peak would go back into the through the continuum. But it does, right? You have an exciton, you ionize it, you see the you see free carriers. Whereas it seems that this thing is, is yeah. So uh, what we're what we think is what, what what we think is happening is that uh, you know imagine that the car the exotonic peak wasn't on top of the continuum but below. So what happens is that you pump the system. You have hot carriers. They cool towards the band edge through some you know uh, some sort of cooling. And then once they're at the band edge, they form excitons, so they're below the band edge. So now the only way they can go is to recombine with each other. They, like, it would be weird for them to then gain energy and go back. Well, they can absorb the yeah. same like back to yeah. ionize by absorbing the phone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Um, so, so, so we, we, we uh, don't see this. Exactly. Yeah. So that's interesting. Um, OK. So how do we explain this uh, slowdown? Uh, Ten, minutes. 10 minutes. OK. Uh, I still have a lot. Uh, okay, I want to talk about. Uh, okay, uh, I want to get to a new set of experiments uh, that we have done on a related compound, three two, a strontium iridate three two seven. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly explain this, and then maybe we can talk after if you have questions about it. But we think um, one way to explain this slowdown is if you're recombining instead of through the emission of one photon, but through the emission of like let's say ten magnons, then as the gap. You know, then it's very sensitive to the gap size because the bigger the gap, the more uh, like uh, bosons you would need to emit, right? Um, and we think that this might explain um, the temperature dependence that we see in strontium iridate because, as Dong Song pointed out a few days ago, the optical conductivity or the, the band gap in this material is actually very temperature sensitive. So as we cool down, you're actually hardening the gap a lot. Uh, and you should see uh, a slowdown accordingly in, in, in the dynamics. Uh, and we uh, fit this with this model for this type of decay, and we see that the, all the fitting parameters actually lie within the theoretically expected range. So this is uh, kind of what we uh, think is happening with the recombination. So uh, I want to go on to uh, another story, which is what address, uh, we, to address the energy scale that we're seeing. Right? So you might ask, you're seeing something at like 1, 2 terahertz. But actually, I spent so much time talking about how the energy scale should actually be set by the spin exchange, right, J. And I, I told you that that's 60 MeV. So what, what, is, what, what, is, what is this peak that we're seeing? How do we address the energy scale? Uh, so we worked with uh, Zala Lenarchic at the Josef Stefan Institute uh, to do some ED simulations just to get some intuition of what the spectrum looks like and what exactly we'd be probing in the spectrum. So uh, we did uh, an e or I guess Zala did an ED simulation of uh, the TJ model uh, plus V, so plus nearest neighbor interactions, uh, uh, nearest neighbor Coulomb, just to account for any Coulomb component that could bind these excitons. Uh, and what Zala found was that below this uh, dense set of states, which we call the holland dublin continuum, were a discrete set of states, right? And uh, we can find the symmetry of each of these states. Uh, so the the lower symmetry is F S. And then unlike a hydrogenic spectrum, the next state is D, and then S again, and then P. So these are the available optical transitions. So it's possible that we're seeing like some higher order transition from one excited state to another. And we think that there, you know, many of the excitonic states should be excited because remember that this excitonic fluid is forming out of very hot carriers. So it's very unlikely that these free carriers all go into the ground state of the excitonic spectrum. We probably have some spread in population among uh, all the exotonic states. Um, and then Zala also found some uh, evidence for uh, uh, spin-based binding in this material. So uh, what here I'm showing the real space depiction of uh, the holon concentration around the double. So I fixed the double at the center. And then uh, the darker the spot and the bigger the spot, the more likely you'll find a holon at that spot. right? So what we did was we fixed the holon uh, at its most likely position. And then we uh, calculated the deviations in the spin uh, correlator, uh, the spin spin, the average of s dot s, uh, relative to the uh, uh, ground state with no uh, hole and double on pairs. And what you see is for this uh, lowest state, the ground state of the exciton, uh, all these deviations, again, uh, the darker and bigger the spot, the more kind of excited that bond is. So uh, the more uh, magnetic energy there is. So, uh, at, at, in this lowest state, you see that the Holland and Dublin are nearest neighbors, and the range of the spin excitations is centered right around the pair. And actually, you have some energetically favorable sites. The dashed lines are, are a negative uh, change, right, outside. 
But as you go to this highest state, this p state, uh, they are no longer on nearest neighbors pair, nearest neighbor pairs, uh, and there are more. Uh, there's more damage to the magnetic degrees of freedom. So if you basically integrate the change in the magnetic uh, energy, uh, you'll see that uh, it increases as you become less bound. So this is some numerical evidence that we're bound through space. Okay, I don't have time to talk about uh, what I really wanted to talk about, which was the next experiment, but I'll, I'll just quickly say the conclusion, and then you can, uh, if you have concerns, we can talk about it after. But what we did was uh, we wanted some experimental evidence for spin binding. So uh, we we're like, okay, what happens if we go above T nail? And with trying to urinate, we saw that the exciton remains stable above T nail. And this makes sense because strontium urinate is a two dimensional uh, Heisenberg system. So actually, the, the value read for T nail is very dimensionally frustrated, meaning that uh, the, real, the, the real temperature where the spin spin correlations disappear is much higher, like maybe 600 Kelvin. So when you're even at uh, T over T nail of 1.4, uh, you still have. Uh, spin spin uh, correlations of you know 10 to the 2 lattice size. So, from the perspective of the exciton, nothing has changed as you warm up above T nail. So, what we did was we studied uh, strontium urinate 327, which is the bilayer analog of strontium urinate 214 in this pyrochlor series of, of irritates. Uh, and because of this bi bi bilayer nature, uh, there are more you know, exchange constants to keep in track of. And in particular, this JC, the exchange constant, the in interlayer exchange constant is very important. And what uh, different groups have found is that the magnetism in strontium area 327 is likely part of the 3D easing universality class as opposed to the 2D Heisenberg universality class. And the, you know, the implication behind this is that uh, above TNAL, the correlations shut off at a much more rapid rate. So whereas the correlations last to much higher temperatures in 214, in 327, they kind of decay quickly. So the question was in 327, can we see these excitons? And if so, is there any difference as we cool across T nail? And you know, we see the exciton, uh, and we did the experiment, we saw the exciton. We say the, the, the same Druda to Lorentz crossover, and we study the temperature dependence, and you see that right above T nail, T nail in this material is uh, 285 Kelvin, you see that this excitonic mode here uh, disappears. This, this peak here is a, a, a phone. So uh, this, to us, indicates that you know, the antiferromagnetic correlations, if you study these materials in, in the critical region, are very you know, necessary, or are necessary for the exciton to form. That they can't form in a temperature region that doesn't have strong antiferromagnetic correlations. Uh, and then, yeah, uh, the, the, that was just some more analysis. But yeah, so the conclusion and outlook is that we established the, the formation of an excitonic gas in these iridate uh, antiferromagnets. Uh, we observed uh, signatures of a magnon or a boson mediated uh, recombination mechanism. And we observe some signatures, or some evidence for experimental evidence for spin mediated binding of these pairs. And then that looks are can we start to study uh, excitons in other MOT systems with different magnetic degrees of freedom or different, uh, for example, going back to Andrea's thing about uh, ferromagnetism, uh, you know, in a triangular lattice, actually ferromagnetism becomes, the motion of a hole through a ferromagnet actually becomes frustrated. So, how does the property of an exciton change in that system? Uh, you know, is there, uh, this is more, you know, forward-looking, but is similar. I, I discussed how there's this many-body phase diagram of excitons. Is there an equivalent uh, phase diagram for Mott excitons, or these spin-bound excitons? And then, how does the formation of these excitons, going back to what I started with, how does this, uh, how does the formation, now that we know these excitons form in this photo-excited state, how does that knowledge inform past experiments that we've already done on photodopaminous and how does it inform future experiments as we look for all of these predicted uh, photodope phases? Thank you. Sorry for going about time. <laughs> oh, and I, I just want to acknowledge everybody uh, I worked with uh, at Caltech uh, and, and these other institutions, and also the people that have helped me along the way, like some members uh, of Andrea's group. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, they, they, you started your talk with this cartoon that you excite the, the lowest exciton, and then you do a, a, the probe on the higher ones. Yeah. So in principle, you can measure their energy. Yeah. And then, and then uh, uh, kind of uh, extract the binding energy. Yeah. Is it possible? And then um, number two is that these are these have like very strict selection rules. As, as yeah. As well as well as well. Yeah. So did you see that some of them are actually not? So, so this is a very important question that we're actually trying to do. It, it's it's okay. So we observed this mode at like uh, okay. So first the binding energy question. So 
this, this exact experiment has been done in, in gallium arsenide and, and also the TMDCs. And there, you know, you know in equilibrium where the excitons are. So you know exactly what transition you're probing. And there, yeah, you can look at this excitonic transition and understand the binding energy. But in this case, you know, from Zala's experiment, first, it's not a hydrogenic spectrum. So you don't know, like, you know, in, in the case of a hydrogenic spectrum, I know that the energy difference between the one, at, the one state and the two state, I should know what then the binding energy is. But in this case, I don't know what the spectrum, I mean, you have to take these calculations of the green salt and the real material might be different. So we don't know. And then second, the second reason we don't know which state we're actually probing or which transition, so that adds another complication of like extracting uh, an actual binding energy from this. We have some yeah. estimates, but we are certainly sure that they're not correct. So. Okay, yeah, we should definitely need to talk. Actually, <laughs> yeah, check. Your, your work with the Victor was actually very helpful to understand uh, all this. So, and so it's good to check whether it's completely off. Yeah, we should, we should talk. Yeah. So, why an exciton and not a magnetic polar on? I mean, wouldn't a magnetic polar on give me the same thing? Um, right, you have some free carries in track. Do magnetic polarons, uh, I don't know if I just from a magnetic background, you, you deform the, and then it scales with the nail temperature. And the but the question is, do magnetic polarons have this internal structure? Right, like an exciton sure. has a... I mean, it's kind of depends, but it depends on molecule and the... And the I mean, that's, a, that's honestly a, a good question. One the problem with this work is that we, we can posit that it's an exciton, but we don't have, beyond the observation of this one peak, we don't have any further proof that this is really, you know, this is one explanation that I think makes sense. Yeah. But uh, the other reason yeah, is the system. The work on magnetic polarons also is synthetic from gas. The other reason we think it's an exciton and not a polaron can is. Can I comment on this? Yeah. So the biggest difference is, uh, the actual analog of this is a magnetic polaron, which okay. is uh, interpreted as pretty deep calm. So the calm is believed to be vibrational excitation of magnetic polar, but it still has angular momentum of zero. So therefore, what, what we can see in our case is only from L equals to zero, you go to L equals to zero. But in this case, you have to go from L equals, whatever, from L to L plus one. That's why you see different quantum numbers. But in fact, you can compute also finite angular momentum versions of magnetic polar ones, but you do not see them in regular arc. One needs pump in the probe. Right, but here he's measuring optical absorption at low energies. The, the, and now if you have the... Uh, just, just real quick before, the, the other reason I think it's an exciton is remember the system becomes insulating yeah. as this exciton forms. So a polaron actually would still, the system would still be conductive to some sense, right? Oh, I, 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 it depends how immobile the, the yeah. polaron is, right? But uh, yeah, this is an open question. But yeah. kind of, this is, uh, it's an open question. But uh, yeah, there's, there's no clear. Just that, that yeah. that was, that was, but, but this data set is limited in that sense, and that you can't really distinguish between all, all of these possibilities. Yeah. Okay, now have okay. our next speaker set up, and then we'll take one more question. So, what if you pump it harder to be on the mod? Uh, okay. To insulate uh, the insulate to metal transient temperature. This is actually a very good question. Um, we pump pretty hard, like in terms of excitation density, higher even than the TMDs, which show a uh, very high MUT threshold, and we still don't see uh, the MUT transition. So that uh, implies that either the excitons are very small or something, where the MUT transition is just very high, or that uh, we have to rethink what like the MUT transition is for these spin-bound carriers, right? Because what happens in the MUT transition in the semiconductors is that you start to screen the Coulomb potential enough such that they can't bind anymore, but I don't know what the analog of that mechanism would be for a, a spin-bound carrier. Um, so we're still kind of thinking uh, about this. 